Now, as we introduce this uh, module, I think it's important to look at some things that um, educators should consider as we develop, as they, we develop the future training programs. Uh, some things that are really important for us to consider are um, those things that are important to you in your program or for your organization, for your company. Also, one that uh, concept that's especially intriguing and useful to you, something that you can, you know, you're yourself are passionate about and can get excited about. Don't have to, you know, drum up a bunch of motivation to get going, but something that you really enjoy doing as you work at um, designing your future training program to be able to, uh, you know, come up with some neat ideas and innovate and to be able to to pass those on to those that you're training or educating uh, is very, very helpful to con consider as you move forward. Obviously, there are more, but these are just a couple of them. Now, as we move forward in this presentation, another important issue or factor that we must consider as educators is our credibility. Credibility is important. It's, in many uh, ways, it's the foundation of our teaching and our ability to communicate and to educate those who are put in our trust. If we don't have credibility and, and those who are coming to learn from us don't believe in us, don't think that we have their best interests, aren't prepared ourselves adequately, we lose the, the, the fight even before we've begun. We've lost the battle even before... We've, we've had a chance to start our, our courses with, uh, with those who are entrusted to us. So credibility really is one of the most important factors that we have uh, going forward as we work with those who are entrusted to us, who come to us for training, for education. And as we look at the next slide, we'll look at some of the um, <clears throat> different kinds of credibility. There are five kinds of credibility, and as we look at it um, on this slide here, we'll look at this, the kinds and the time periods that correspond to when uh, these take place, these different types of credibility. First is inherent. Inherent credibility is related to our gender or nationality, and this obviously is before training. This is something we bring with us, and this is something that as a trainer or as a teacher, an educator, um, is something that we have inherently with us. So, uh, for example, around gender, if you're a female talking about female issues, you obviously have more inherent credibility than a male talking about female issues. Um, you'd have to have a lot of training, a lot of uh, background and experience, maybe as a, as a medical doctor or as a researcher, something like that. The next one is conferred credibility. Um, this is where we receive our licenses, our degrees, um, even some not only having those degrees, but maybe from a prestigious institution. Um, or we have recognition by um, respected organizations that we're a part of, or we're associated with individuals of great stature, maybe political, maybe educational, academic, uh, uh, just popular people like movie stars or um, newsmakers or news organizations. Just um, the conferred uh, aspect or, or type of credibility, once again, that is before training as well. That um, corresponds with the inherent. is something that uh, we bring to the training and something that we um, have with us when we get there. The next type of, of credibility is considered to be expert credibility. Um, this is a person's knowledge of a subject being dealt with or someone's professional skills that they have. So it's things that they have worked hard and long at, um, and so we would consider them to be an expert. Uh, this is something that is displayed during the training as one is giving illustrations and working things through. Um, people can realize and determine whether that person is an expert or not. And so this is uh, a credibility that, uh, uh, a, a type of the credibility that is, is really critical during the training um, or education classroom period that will actually help um, students become more engaged because they realize that the person that's teaching them does know what they're talking about. Uh, congruent uh, 
credibility is gained um, if a person has qualities consistent with the client organization and with the individual the trainer is working with. So, for example, in a, in a, in a cross-cultural, multicultural setting, um, this congruent training would, would align with the cultural values system of the folks that uh, you're working with in a different culture. So you can see how you're going forward as vision and a value system to build with um, your global education uh, enterprise in teaching that this is really, really critical to um, establishing credibility, the congruent credibility. And then fifth, uh, the last one is co contribution. Um, this one actually occurs uh, following the um, training session or the classroom or the course. Um, this con uh, contribution credibility is information or insights which provide accurate, valuable, and viable information for media and or long-term use. So this could be some statistics, some um, examples, some stories, and things like that that are very uh, useful for uh, for your those that you are educating or training. Um, that they can apply as they move forward um, in their in their experience with that different culture and, and learning um, how to interact in a better way. Another critical issue moving forward uh, um, as you think of value system for um, working in globalization and education and, and in the going global enterprise with your um, if you're an HR uh, trainer or with an education system, an institution, or or a uh, non-government organization, NGO, something like that that you're working with, is trust. Trust in a training environment is really critical. Um, and, and I think that the more um, trust you can give folks at the beginning, the better. Um, the amount of trust that you give to others is the amount of trust they'll trust you. So if you don't trust them, those you're training, they probably don't trust you. So, um, and really, bottom line is, if you don't trust them, why are you educating or training them? Is it just a job, or um, those that you've you've brought into your midst? Are they there for? Um, what are they there for? What is the reason they're there for? They're obviously there to learn and want to be there. So, I think you know, trust, giving trust. Uh, establishing ways at the very beginning where you can build trust, uh, maybe handing off responsibilities to others um, at the beginning, maybe taking role, um, maybe, um, you know, other small ways where they can run errands or do things. Uh, you build trust and responsibility, uh, give them uh, projects to work on as group, maybe appoint group leaders, um, put people into groups if do something like that. Just creative ways to create trust in a um, in your training and education environments. Another critical feature to uh, consider is your communication style. Um, this is really important, um, deciding on how you're going to do that, or maybe if you do a mix of, of a both, but there's a high context and low context style. Obviously, with so many opportunities today with technology and and being able to do things that way, a lot of times it's uh, more efficient to do that. Uh, but there are also critical moments when we need that face-to-face -face contact as well. So in the high context style, we've got a high context and low context style. And we'll look at these a little bit more in detail in the slides coming up. A high context communication style really demonstrates the co in context and interconnectedness. So, for example, a hierarchical context where the president of an organization will hire the training, you know, really comes up and, you know, validates and shows the importance of the training by his presence being there, um, includes the trainees and expectations and, and, and dialogue with him and things that, that they'd like to see as a group or as, a, as an institution. A chronological context also demonstrates interconnectedness, but it also uses high-ranking officials to remind trainees of the organization's history. So like a president of a university or a chancellor or somebody like that coming along and, you know, reaffirming, you know, commencement or at um, different assemblies for an institution. Um, in the, within the organization, the president of the organization may do the same thing, um, give examples, illustrate, um, show how the training and the education part of the of the uh, 
piece of the organization is key to continuing on the value system of that of that institution or organization. Another example would be physical context, where this you'd carefully choose the location of the training session, you know, take in the size, the size and shape and color lighting of the room, the furniture you might use, the temperature of the room. This is a considered another form of the, the of the high context communication. And then also social context would be like the fourth uh, context. This type of context includes opportunities for comfortable interaction among participants and trainers. You may have a dinner, may have a luncheon, some drinks, some small group dis discussions, some team projects, or even some field trips. And then the fifth and final um, high text or high context communication would be the personal context where trainers offer verbal, nonverbal report, building opportunities to the training participants in order to build professional relationships with the participants and encourage their commitment to the training program. So more of the one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, with those who you are um, working with going forward in the future. So a little bit of all these combination in the high context communication could be very, very beneficial. Okay, for the low context communication style, this usually includes a description and lists of information that need to be conveyed. So a lot of times this can be done through, uh, through the use of technology a lot of ways uh, when you're interacting with a group, um, like things like passing out a schedule. Um, days events or a calendar. You could do that through uh, through email or through a, a course management system or a portal that you may have set up within your HR training uh, uh, organization, you know, system there. Um, you directly launch presentations, discussions of initial topics to be discussed. You could actually, you know, maybe if you've been in an organization where you've gone, gone through some HR training, you know, I'll see the videos that are up, then you go through those training. I know at our institution, we do a lot of that um, just remotely. We just go on and we do uh, pieces of training, whether it's related to um, IT uh, or security or ethics training or sexual harassment. A lot of that we can do um, the option of doing that with uh, technology. Um, Another thing you do on this is, you know, you can provide in these low text, low context communications, provide explanations um, where you can just give out facts and figures and numbers. A lot of times these may be even done with a PowerPoint presentation or a keynote or something else, uh, some sort of presentation. A few other considerations for low context uh, communication. Uh, as you think about your values and vision going forward with your training for your uh, globalization piece of your of your course or your program or for your training at your company would be to you know you can you can use low context to summarize points covered and you know, like do a summary and okay send this out make sure everybody's on the same page this is kind of what we you know write it down this is what we we talked about um, you can also uh, be preemptive and plan and write down specific action steps that you'd like to do in the in the future and you know put those in measurable obtainable uh, concrete results and steps that you can do to, to get those results uh, encourage program participation ask questions and give direct focused answers you could use wikis for these or different survey instruments on you know on the um, through web 2.0 uh, technologies and applications a lot of things you can do that or, or just with a discussion board um, you could also have Participants do evaluations or surveys through a, a survey monkey or something like that or um, Zoomerang, things that are out there. There's so many things. Doodle is another one. Um, just a lot of things that are available. And then um, you can also, you know, send a farewell greeting at the end of a program through an email or through an announcement or video uh, announcement, things like that that you can use. So uh, low context communication, high tech, high context communication, different um, uses for different different applications for different uses for different needs that you might have and in integrating both of these styles into uh, your communication will be very very critical uh, for the success of your program as well and to engage students and uh, those that you are training. Another area is really critical for value system and vision as you move forward 
um, thinking about training, educating those in a multicultural society with this, the, the millennial generation in particular is the idea of collaborative learning. Um, here we are working with the group, allowing the group to work together to solve a problem, to come up with a solution, to manage a, a situation. And um, here the group can really uh, use its strengths and, and, and not just rely on one person's ability, but be able to pull the strengths from, from multiple individuals. Um, and in here, you, this is where trust again, uh, giving that trust over to the group to be able to um, manage learning and to come up with the results. Um, and in here also to make sure that each uh, person is, is contributing and giving, giving back to the group and being able to be engaged in real dialogue. Uh, some things you may be able to do is interject um, or listen to the group and interject questions in order to expand the thoughts. And, you know, as you work with those at your those groups that you're training and educating, um, you know, can spend some time there and really multiply your time through through group learning and be able to help them to see and to come to solutions to issues that the, that they may be facing in a particular context. So to summarize this uh, values and visions lecture and we think about the future of training and how it's best to work with those in a multicultural society and a global society the millennial generation coming up um, thinking of different ways creative innovative ways using a mix of technology and one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, opportunities that you may have uh, and, and, and needs for so different applications for different needs not getting stuck in, in a rut in one in one area only um, thinking of other ways to communicate uh, your material than rather than just by lecture, uh, but more or less allowing groups to collaborate <clears throat> and work together to solve problems. Ultimately, I think overall we really want to be respectful of those that we're working with um, and just maintain an overall sense of interconnectedness with the group that you're training, those that you're working with in the groups. and. Realize that life does happen, life goes on, uh, things are going to happen, and people may not be able to make the outcomes that you intend them to, but to, to have those outcomes, but then to be able to be flexible and to adjust and to work around uh, people's, you know, especially in this global dynamic society that we're all a part of with things happening, people being in different parts of the world and and even in, within within the states, different parts of the country from their family may need to to, to go and, and serve uh, and help their family in, in emergencies and being able to adjust and to work with that. So I think that all that just kind of gives the idea and the, and the flavor and feeling of being flexible and respectful of those that we're working with, which goes a long way to help with that trust and that credibility issue. So I hope you have enjoyed this this lecture and uh, this course and that concludes the lectures for this course for education uh, EDUC 552